Okay, in this session, what I want to do is I want to ground our abstract discussion of the transaction details in a specific example of a transaction that uh, was undertaken that we saw previously. If you remember, in a previous session, we looked at a transaction and we watched it get confirmed in which we sent uh, an initial balance that was given to me by Coinbase.com for opening an account. We sent that amount to my local client running on my local machine. We transferred the rights to those Bitcoin to my local machine. My local machine then, once those transactions were confirmed, sent them back to Coinbase.com. So let's look at those transactions on the blockchain in order to get a better sense of the details of what's involved in doing those transactions. All right, if we do that, we can dig into, let's look at the one that sent it from my local client back to Coinbase.com. We look at the details, and in Coinbase.com, we can get the name of the transaction here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go look, use a different website in order to take a look at this transaction. And this, this um, website is called uh, BlockExplorer.com. And BlockExplorer.com offers uh, a view of all the different blocks, uh, all the different transactions and blocks that are on the blockchain. Now, I don't have to go to this website in order to see the blockchain. The blockchain is all contained on my local computer. I've downloaded it because I'm synchronized. So this data is on my computer, but it's just a little bit more convenient to go to the website and use the interface that they have for exploring the contents of the blockchain. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the transaction that sent the Bitcoin from my local client back to Coinbase.com. We can, um, we can explore it here in this HTML version. This is a little complicated for me to, to look at with all the links and everything, so we're just going to look at the raw transaction here. All right, this is a little easier for me to parse, actually. So what we can see here is that this is a transaction, and it's a transaction whose name is a hash code here. And this hash, as we've talked about previously, is a hash of all the information that's below it, signature of that. We see here that we specify that the version, the, the syntax, the language, the fields that we're going to be using for this transaction are version 1. And we have a couple different parameters here. This first parameter says, how many inputs do we have in this transaction? And we have one input in this transaction. So it's the input size. And if we look down here, we see, okay, here's our input. And oh yeah, here we go. This, here is the one input that we've got into this transaction. How many outputs do we have? Well, here we see we have two outputs listed. And if we come down here, uh, yep, in fact, there are two outputs listed. One output here and one output here. Here we see we have uh, a parameter called lock time that's not used in this transaction. We have a parameter that describes how large this transaction is in bytes, 258. And then we have the details of the input. So what we see here is we see uh, three things. First of all, what we see is we see a link um, back to the transaction from which we're going to pull the Bitcoin. So we say, where are we going to get the um, Bitcoin that's represented in this transaction? Well, we're going to say that the Bitcoin that we're using in this transaction comes from the Bitcoin whose name is this hash, starts with 84C24. And because each transaction can have more than one output, it says it's going to come from this transaction and we're gonna, we're, what we're referencing is the first output of that transaction. We mentioned in the abstract video that when we decide that we're going to use the um, output of one transaction as an input, we have to provide proof that we have rights to use the output. And this here, the script signature, is where we put the proof that we have rights to be able to use the output of this previous transaction as the input to this transaction. All right, we'll look at that in detail in a second. In this transaction, though, there are two outputs. Here's the transaction. Here's the output in which I send 0 0.0015 Bitcoin back to Coinbase.com. There's a second output here, which represents a cha change that I'm sending back to my local client. And I'm going to send 0 0.0000512 change back to my local client. There is a difference here, and the difference there represents the fee. And that difference is the amount from the output of this transaction, however much the output of this transaction is, which is however much it is greater than the sum of these transactions, becomes the fee. So this is the transaction that represents moving money from my local client back to Coinbase.com. So if we move back in time, we want to, let's, go, let's go find this transaction here. From where are we getting the Bitcoin? Okay, well, we're looking at 
a Bitcoin whose hash starts with 84cc and the output number one. So we go back here, we can load up that client, we can load up that transaction from the block explorer. Let's look at it raw also. And we can see, okay, here are the outputs of that. And say, oh yeah, here it is. Look, here's the first output, output number zero. Remember, we're using computer science numbering. Output zero was sending 0 0.001577 Bitcoin. So we're going to take that Bitcoin and use it as input um, to the next Bitcoin. And here's where we specify the conditions about who can use the output of this transaction. Who can use this first output? The conditions are um, packaged here. All right, so this is a little bit difficult to read if you're not familiar with the notation. It's a little abstract what's happening here. So what I did is I tried to take this information from the transaction 84C that has um, one input and has two outputs. And I tried to represent it a little bit more abstractly so you could understand what's happening here. All right, so here's a little bit better uh, view of what's happening. All right, so what we've got here is um, at, at this point in time, this represents the rights to the Bitcoin that exist at Coinbase.com. And when I said told Coinbase.com that I wanted to send it to my send Bitcoin to my local client, what they did is they constructed this transaction for me, which referenced the Bitcoin that they were keeping track of and passed it off to my local client. They included some additional Bitcoin here. I don't know where that came from. That's some extra Bitcoin that they have given to me in order to pay transaction fees. Um, and they're just giving me the transaction fees for free. So that's something that they're, the company Coinbase.com is eating for some reason so that it looks like I'm getting the full amount of Bitcoin from Coinbase.com that I had sent to my local client. Okay, so most of the output is going here to the rights on my local machine. But some of the output is also going to the change here. If you add these up, the sum of those transactions is here. And if you add these up, the sum of those transactions is here. And the balance is 0 0.0002, which becomes the fee for this transaction. So the miner, which includes this transaction in the block, and then closes the block, gets to take the reward for the block, plus this fee and any other fees associated with the transactions in that um, block. All right, so after this transaction has been included into, into, the into a block, we can say that now I have rights to Bitcoin. At this moment, after the transaction has happened, I now have 0 0.001577 Bitcoin in my local client. All right, so my local client then has the rights in order to um, move the Bitcoin. And this, is, this transaction represents transferring the local, from my local client, transferring the rights to those Bitcoin back to Coinbase.com. And that was the transaction 13AA. The inputs to that transaction were the outputs of this transaction. That was the only input that this transaction had, and it summed to the amount of that, of, of this, quite straightforward. And then the outputs that we had, we had two outputs, two explicit outputs. One was sending some rights to Bitcoin back to my Coinbase.com key, and the other was sending some change back to my local client. Now these two sum up to this amount here, and there's a balance which represents the fee, so that when the miner includes my transaction in their block, they get the reward for that block in addition to the fees. All right, So that's, that's how the flow happened uh, from one place from one transaction uh, to another transaction. Now we we, spec we said that there's some there's some conditions here that are in the outputs, and those conditions have to be met on the inputs in order for this client to be recognized as having the rights to transfer these bitcoins. This is where the public keys and the private keys come into play. When I send bitcoin to someone, what I do is I specify the public key in this condition. And the person who wants to take the inputs has to be able to sign the transaction with the private key in order to, in order to demonstrate that they have the private key and therefore have rights to the input. So let's go back and let's look at what we had there as the conditions for this output and the inputs and the um, proof that we had rights to that at the inputs here. To be honest, 
This is really low-level details, but I think this is one of the most exciting aspects of Bitcoin because there's quite a bit of flexibility here to do some very creative things. All right, so if we go back and we look at our transaction, um, let's see, uh, we're, looking for, we're looking at transaction A4CC, and we have here uh, the conditions for being able to spend the Bitcoin uh, referenced here. And it's, it's this strange sequence of characters. It's a, some sort of language. And in fact, it's a, it, it's, it's a simple programming language that says that if you can solve this programming language, if, if you have the ability to execute this programming, uh, this program, which is represented here, then you can have the rights. Now, it's a cryptographic program, and it's where we, re where we solve the public key, private key um, aspect of this. Okay, so now let's look at this. Just keep an eye on this. We have op dupe, op hash, we have this, op equal verify, op check save. All right, those are the conditions. And then when this becomes the input to the next transaction, the inputs here use this thing called a script signature as proof that you've met the conditions of the previous outputs. So the, the, the proof here is these two strings of characters. So let's see if we can um, represent that in a way that's um, a little bit more clear so that we can see what's happening. And I'll walk you through how this program gets executed um, so that you can validate that you have rights to the Bitcoin. All right. So this is All right. So this here is the conditions that were in our output represented in blocks, and these are the conditions, these were the proof that were in our input. And it turns out that the proof that were in our input, that first string, is a digital signature of the previous transaction. And the second string was a public key. So what happens here is that we put these things together to form a, a program. And let's see if we can execute this. All right, so what we do is we take these, and these become commands that we're going to run in, in, in order. I'm going to put all these together. Um, let's see, how can I... It's taking up a little too much screen space. Um, so, let's see. So, what the way this runs is this becomes a sequence of commands. Uh, I would lay them all out in a line, but I'm out of screen space. All right. And so, the way that we execute this is we walk through box by box executing these commands. All right, so our first command is this, uh, is this sequence of text. And this sequence of text, if it doesn't have uh, a command associated with these operators, then what we're going to do is we're going to move it over here into a temporary holding spot. Great. And then the next thing that we see in our list of programs is another string of characters. So we're going to move that over into our holding area. We don't really know what these are yet. Okay, now we're going to start taking the characters, or we're going to start taking the commands that were located in the output of our previous transaction, and we're going to execute them. So our first command from our output was this op dupe. And what op dupe means is it says, take whatever was the last thing that you processed and make a copy of it. Okay, great. All right, so that, then this has been executed. The next thing it says is take whatever was on whatever is over here on the bottom and take a hash of it. Okay, so we're going to hash this. So now instead of having this, we're going to take the hash of this. So we're going to take the hash of a public key. All right, then the next thing that we've got is we've got this another, another string of characters and that other string of characters is now going to go over here. Right, so this is the, our hash. And these have been executed. And now what we need to do is we need to execute this command, and that says verify. Okay, so that says that what we need to verify is we need to verify that the hash of the public key is equal to this string of characters here. Now remember, this string of characters was provided by the, per the sender, and this, and this string was provided by the receiver. So what this says is that when you send Bitcoin to someone, you get their public key, and you hash it, and you put it in the transaction. If you want to receive those public keys, 
but you want to receive those bitcoins, you must be able to produce the public key which hashes to the same value. Okay, if these, these two things are equal, then everything's great and you can move on. All right, so let's just say that they were equal. That means that the recipient was able to produce the same public key that hashed to the same value. All right. Then the last thing that we do is we check the signature to make sure it's valid. Now the signature is going to be is going to take as inputs the two things that are here on the stack and are going to evaluate them. And they're going to say, okay, a signature, remember, is when you take when you when you encrypt something with a private key. And so what this says is what has to happen is that the recipient has to be able to sign the transaction using a private key and then we have to be able to decrypt that transaction with this public key. All right. And so then if you can do that, if you can produce the private key to which you can sign this transaction and matches the public key, then you have rights to the Bitcoin. So the first thing that you had to do is you had to produce the public key. And then if you could produce the public key that has the right hash, then you also had to be able to sign the transaction with the private key that matched this public key. All right. If you want to dig into that in more detail, you can. But what's, what's just kind of really exciting to me about that is the way in which this proof happens. The conditions are provided here on the outputs. You match that with proof on the inputs. Those two things together form a little computer program that have to be executed in order to get rights to the Bitcoin that were sent here. The reason why that's exciting to me is because that computer program can be any number of very, very interesting cryptographic proofs. Um, you can have different kinds of contracts that are represented there. So you could say things like, you can have rights to those Bitcoins if you and two other people agree that um, those rights should be transferred to the next person. So maybe you have to produce three public keys and three private keys in order to move the Bitcoins forward. Um, you could do things even more interesting, like maybe you have to produce, maybe there are three public keys and three private keys, but it only has to be signed by two of them. And so in that way, you could do various kinds of escrow payments, uh, various kinds of contracts. Uh, you can make those public and private keys depend on real world events so that the bit key can only be transferred if certain real world events occur. There's a lot of really interesting things that you can have happen there. And I think this is where some of the most important innovations are going to happen in the future for blockchain technology. Okay. So we looked at, in, so to, just to summarize here, we looked at Coinbase, we uh, found the transactions that we executed, we looked up those transactions on Block Explorer, we saw the details of them, I showed you how they looked abstractly, uh, and then we looked at the language by, by which we executed this command in order to justify that we had proved the inputs. If you want to see a little bit more information about um, how that happens, uh, you can look on the Bitcoin wiki here. This will walk you through. Uh, this web page will walk you through how to execute that program and some other ones if you want to look in a little bit more detail. So this is a little bit more detail of that process that I just showed you. Go to the Bitcoin wiki transaction. Um, and if you'd like to know the full range of what's available for you to execute these commands, because there's a whole lot of operators that are available, also on the wiki, so this is a great resource in general for all things Bitcoin, but also on the wiki is this description of, this, of the programming language that's run, that can be run. And you can see there's a whole bunch of commands that can be used to create very complicated uh, cryptographic conditions for transferring the rights of Bitcoin from one party to another. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for your attention. This is a little bit of a technical introduction to what's happening on the blockchain, but for some of you it'll be really interesting to see where all that magic happens, and it's I think it's very neat.